There we go. Hopefully everybody can see that now. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Craig Wilson. I'm with the I'm the president of BFP Chapter 100 in Alaska, and this workshop is uh, regarding the Arctic Nuclear Weapons Free Zone. Uh, my little part of this will be providing a, a brief introduction for folks, to, so everyone's working off the same page when the other presenters uh, provide uh, their input. They're really the uh, the experts in this. We'll get started here. Um, first off, get everybody lined up as to where the Arctic is. There's a nice little quote. Uh, we tend, if you're in the lower 48, you tend to think of the Arctic as uh, something a little strange. You don't really know where it is. First thing you need to do is change your point of view. Now, this map isn't as bad as a lot of one you see you you saw when you were growing up but try to find the arctic in this map you know the arctic ocean is it over on the upper left the middle it's you know the the map you use uh, reflects your priorities and your point of view and the priorities of most of the world are not in the arctic if you live up here this is the way you, you view it you know, you've got the, the North Pole at the center, and all of a sudden you've actually see, you can see that you actually have an Arctic Ocean, and that um, Russia and U.S. in terms of Alaska are pretty close. As Sarah Palin said, you can, if you're in Alaska, you can see Russia in your backyard. When we define what the Arctic is, there's two general definitions of so when the other folks are talking about it one is that blue circle you see that's 66 degrees north latitude north of that line you have at least one day a year where the sun doesn't come up and one day a year where the sun never goes down a more commonly used definition is that red line this is what the un uses that's where the average summer temperature of the warmest month of the year doesn't go above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But people do live up here. Um, you know, we've got uh, the Arctic covers you know, roughly 40 million square kilometers, um, about 8% of the Earth's surface, and there's about 4 million people who live here. Um, and the native folks that have been living here, the indigenous peoples, have been living here tens of thousands of years, uh, predating uh, colonization of the Americas. Um, many of the groups, um, the Inuit in particular, have uh, bonded together into uh, various groups. The Inuit Circumpolar Conference, or Circumpolar Council rather, covers uh, um, about eight, and they represent about 180,000 Inuit in Alaska, Canada, Greenland, and, and Russia. Um, they hold a status at the UN as a consultant body, and they've come out um, with an Arctic policy. They've they've redone it a number of times, uh, and I'll just notice if you notice this is their latest Arctic policy. Um, says item eight. No nuclear weapons in the Arctic, no nuclear testing, no nuclear disposal, no um, you know, transportation of no radioactive mining there opposed to all this. And you might go, well, why you know how did that happen? And well, there's a lot of history of nuclear weapons in the Arctic. You know, as most folks are probably aware. There's been a lot of nuclear testing, um, primarily by the US and Russia. Uh, you know, 2000 some odd nuclear tests um, before the test ban treaty came into effect. And of those, uh, a large number are in Russia, were in the Arctic. Russia in particular, they at Nova, Novaya Zemlya, over 224 nuclear tests. 
and equivalent to uh, 265 metric million uh, tons of dynamite, including the, uh, the world's largest nuclear weapon that was ever tested, the SAR Bomba, back in uh, 1961. Uh, basically, this was the um, one-off uh, trying to make the Russians look good. Uh, it was roughly, to give you the idea, 33,600 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The shock wave from that bomb circled the globe three times. And the flash was seen in Norway, over a thousand kilometers away. Here in Alaska, um, there were three nuclear tests over on a yeah, Amchitka Island. Um, in the Aleutians, including the Kanakin test, which was uh, the largest met, the largest test in the U.S. Um, the Department of Energy and the military decided to do it on Amchitka because the bomb was actually too large to safely detonate in Nevada. And uh, as a side note, um, the Amchitka test the, the, was actually the one of the initiating events for what now became Greenpeace. And we've had other things up here. Um, one of the items that uh, is little known is uh, Project Chariot. Um, we'll get to that. Um, so there's the Amchika test. The, the Kanakin test was actually, a, you can see the missile on the right. It was part of the uh, Reagan's uh, or Nixon's uh, anti-ballistic missile defense. The idea was put a nuclear warhead on a missile, send it up to blow up the other incoming ballistic missiles. And they thought it was a good idea to basically aim a missile down a hole with a five megaton warhead and see what happens. Project Chariot was a little stranger. This was, um, part of uh, Operation Plowshares. The idea was uh, let's make an artificial harbor in Northwest Alaska by exploding five hydrogen bombs. Uh, we won't really bother telling the folks at Point Hope about it. And um, when they did find out they stopped it, but not before the Department of Energy went and buried radioactive waste from Nevada. Um, at the site just to see what would happen. Uh, as a result, um, the cleanup of that uh, just finished up a few years ago. Uh, it was uh, kind of buried for the longest period of time. And then there's, along with deliberate nuclear testing in the Arctic, um, there's been a number of incidents where nuclear arms or uh, radioactivity has been released into the into the Arctic on purpose or um, not so much on purpose. Uh, Russian Navy has a, a bad habit of either having their nuclear submarines um, explode and sink, such as the Kursk or the Cosmolots, or just basically just decommissioning them and sinking them with uh, their nuclear reactors intact off of, of primarily in the Kara Sea. Uh, right now off of Nevaya Zemla, there are at least 16 reactors um, just sunk in the ocean uh, from 13 submarines and a couple of nuclear icebreakers. The US has also had a few issues. Uh, most uh, notably, uh, a B-52 carrying four hydrogen bombs crashed off of Green Tule, Greenland. Uh, two of those bombs are still at the bottom of the ocean off of Western Greenland. And of course, the Russian Cosmos 954 satellite had a nuclear reactor and uh, entered the atmosphere and broke up over uh, Northern Canada spraying radioactive debris. 
and we all probably remember Chernobyl. So what's happened is all from all those tests is that um, the, the radioactive fallout and about 12% of it ends up being deposited near the test site and about another 10% ends up in a band circling the earth at about the same latitude as a test. So you can look on the right hand side, you can see that we start getting up around you know, 60, 70 degrees north latitude, there's a fair amount of uh, residual radiation um, left over from those nuclear tests. So, a, a brief introduction is for those of you who don't know what a nuclear weapons free zone is, this is not something new. Uh, the original concept dates back to the 1950s. Uh, one was proposed for Eastern Europe in, in the area of Poland and U Ukraine. Uh, the Nordic countries uh, proposed one in 1958. Uh, they were actually written into the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, there's an entire process of how you go about uh, setting one up. Um, and Adele will talk about that more. Um, and currently, there are ten nuclear uh, free weapons zones in the U.S. or in the world now. Um, they cover, you know, like it shows in here, about half the world's mass, uh, and about 1.9 billion people are uh, currently living underneath a nuclear weapons free zone. In the Arctic, the first proposal for this was back in 64. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the Inuit uh, Circumpolar Council, they have been uh, supportive of nuclear weapons free zones in the Arctic since 1974. Even the Russians came out, uh, uh, Gorbachev came out with the Murmansk initiative back in 87 saying, let's make the Arctic a, a nuclear weapons free zone similar to the space or the Antarctic. Or Antarctic. Um, most recent big push was in 2009 at the Copenhagen conference. There's a map and I, Adele will talk about this more. Here's uh, what's currently covered by nuclear weapons free zones in the world. So there's basically all the seabed, all of outer space, Antarctica, big chunks of the South Pacific. And most recently, uh, areas in uh, Mongolia and Central Asia. And these are all under UN charter. Here in Alaska, actually back in the 80s, uh, the state of Alaska came out and did, this is uh, the official state of Alaska policy, it's still on the books, that uh, state of Alaska supports a nuclear freeze and reductions in nuclear warheads, which I was kind of interesting. Um, Vic Fisher, who was not able to join us today, uh, was part of the group that, that pushed this through back in 86, 87 timeframe. So what's going on now? What, you know, why is, why is, it, why is the Arctic uh, becoming a hotbed again? Um, there's a number of drivers that people need to know. Uh, one is, as you've probably heard, uh, global climate change is happening. The, the ice is melting. Um, in the past, from a military standpoint, uh, both Russia and the US, and to a lesser extent, um, the UK and Canada, uh, would put nuclear powered submarines with ballist nuclear ballistic missiles under the ice cap, under the ice in the Arctic Ocean. One, it got them close to their enemies. Two, uh, underneath the ice, they were pretty much immune from detection. That's not happening anymore. Current uh, estimates are that the Arctic Ocean may be seasonally ice-free by 2030 and most likely ice, seasonally ice-free by 2050. Um, this brings up a number of things. One is the submarines can't hide 
in the Arctic Ocean anymore. Two, it opens up um, uh, shipping routes. Um, the northern, the Northwest Passage is now being traversed by cruise ships. The North Sea route is seeing a resurgence across the uh, the North uh, Shore coast of Russia. Um, and the big the big change here is that while uh, those those are opening up, it, the economics of it are being seen by other countries. You know, you you now have China has declared itself a near Arctic nation, whatever that means, and has petitioned to become part of the Arctic Council. Um, so. And they're they're building icebreakers, and they see the economic benefits of this. There's a lot of internal politics going on. Russia is building up their military um, and economic basis along the North Sea route because that's um, Putin sees that as a way to push Russian hegemony in the Arctic. Uh, they also see it as a major economic driver to uh, bring money into into Russia. In the U.S., uh, you now have uh, increased interest in um, what's referred to as Arctic domain awareness, um, where the military is increasing their um, oversight. We're starting to see a lot more uh, U.S. biplanes going into the Barents Sea and over into towards the Kara Sea. We're seeing an uptick in Russian um, maritime reconnaissance aircraft uh, coming into the Bering Sea off the coast of Alaska and being intercepted by U.S. Air Force. And as a, as it melts, there's a lot of um, sovereignty claims. Who owns the Arctic? This is not like the Antarctic, where everybody agrees it's international territory. Um, so, as I said. If you look on the left, you can see the, the North Sea route and the Northwest Passage. And eventually, as the ice melts out, they expect to see, uh, be able to just traverse the Arctic Ocean as you would the Atlantic or the Pacific. The, the driver between behind the North Sea route is that it cuts about 11 days transit time between Europe and China. This is what China's looking at. Um, 11 days of shipping time is billions of dollars annually. So. And sovereignty claims. The way the, the law of the sea works is you get, the country gets the first 200 miles out from the shoreline under what's called the econ exclusive economic zone. And beyond that, if you want to claim the land or the submerged seabed, you have to show that it's part of your continental shelf. Uh, there's, Russia has been very aggressive. You may have seen in the news maybe eight, 10 years ago, they took a submarine out and they literally planted a Russian flag on a submerged ridge by the North Pole saying, this is now Russian territory. So where do we go with this? Um, a couple of things is, on the one hand, you've got the Nordic countries who have had been exposed to Chernobyl, Russian submarines sinking, um, you know, U.S. Uh, B-52s crashing into their oceans. They are all on board with, um, to to some extent, greater or lesser, with an Arctic nuclear weapons freeze. Uh, the holdouts are Russia and the U.S. What's happening now, however, is that, as I said, China is exerting its influence into the Arctic Ocean, and China would love to see uh, a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Arctic, uh, both as a way to um, block U.S. and Russian hegemony and as a way to increase um, China's standing in the world. So what we've done locally 
here at Chapter 100, uh, we planned a Youth Congress uh, for last April, um, bringing in about 40 high school students from around the state and several other countries to uh, Sitka, Alaska to develop ways to uh, eliminate nuclear weapons. The uh, pandemic kind of put the kibosh on that and we went online this year. Uh, there's a website at the bottom of that slide. I uh, suggest you go to there. There are links to three of the webinars that we we did um, that are available for anyone to watch. We are looking at uh, currently planning on redoing the the, the, sun, the uh, Congress next spring, uh, tentatively scheduled for April, uh, again in Sitka. So last slide, what can we do? Uh, one is we will be, chapter 100 will be proposing a resolution to VFP at the next national convention to support an Arctic National Weapons Free Zone. Uh, we would ask everyone to support the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, which has, which is the enabling document to create such a zone. Uh, and basically just uh, speaking to the choir somewhat, but agitate against nuclear weapons testing and deployment and um, aim for abolition of nuclear weapons worldwide. And with that, how do I, we go into